Welcome back to the Origin of the Ether series. In this part we will examine how the science of electricity was taken from the simple static charge to examining the flow of charge. Until the last decade of the 18th century, most scientists who study the phenomena of electricity were only really looking at static electricity. In 1752, Johann Schulze had mentioned that a sandwich of silver and lead when joined together and placed on the tongue gives the taste of vitriol of iron. Yet neither of the metals alone gives any trace of this taste. He postulated that the combination of the two sets up a vibration in their particles which by affecting the nerves of the tongue produces a taste in question. At the time, his observations had no direct connection with electricity. In 1780, Luigi Galvani was studying the susceptibility of nerves to irritation. During a dissection of a frog, a piece of electrical equipment nearby happened to accidentally touch a nerve in the frog, causing the muscle to convulse. Further experiments revealed that the convulsions were caused by the transport of a peculiar fluid from the nerves to the muscles. Galvani considered this fluid to be the same as the ordinary electric fluid and regarded this process to be similar to the discharge from a Leyden jar. Galvani's ideas would cause much outrage and quickly three different camps formed. One who believed in Galvani's ideas, those that felt the two fluids were of a different type and lastly, a group who refused to attribute the effects to a supposed fluid in the nervous system. Alessandro Volta was firmly in the latter camp. In 1792, he put forward the view that the stimulus in Galvani's experiments is derived essentially from the connection of two different metals by a moist body. In 1796, Giovanni Fabroni had observed that when two plates of different metals were placed in water, one of them would be partially oxidized when they were put into contact. From this he rightly concluded that some chemical action was inseparably connected with the galvanic effect. At this stage the galvanic effect was very weak in comparison with electrostatic experiments. One year later, after Galvani's death, in 1800, Volta would make a breakthrough that would change this. He had discovered a means of greatly increasing the intensity of the effect. His breakthrough was to create a series of couples of zinc and copper discs which were separated by a thin disc of moist plasterboard. It now resembled a Leyden jar in terms of power, but had the ability to automatically re-establish its state after discharge. Volta thought that the combination of the two metals set up a tension, allowing the copper to become negative and the zinc positive. This idea seemed to be a mingling of the two ideas of electric charge and electric potential. At the time, it was known that electricity was capable of inducing chemical action. A solution of metallic salts would be decomposed by the current, but exactly how and why this occurred was fiercely debated. It was John Jacobs Berzelius who would take the next step forward. He put forward a theory that explained the chemical affinity arises from the play of electric forces, which in turn spring from the electric charges within the atoms of matter. To be precise, he supposed each atom possessed two poles, which are the seat of opposite electrifications and whose electrostatic field is the cause of the chemical affinity. Two atoms which are about to unite dispose themselves so that the positive pole of one touches the negative pole of the other. Electricities of those two poles then discharge each other, giving rise to heat and light which are observed to accompany the act of combination. The result leaves a compound molecule. This action can then be undone through electrolysis, which is able to separate the two atoms again. This simple concept would later be overthrown by Faraday. Most of his ideas would not even survive during his lifetime, but the most important that did survive was the idea that chemical affinities are of an electrical origin. Interest had begun to grow in the phenomena whereby steel could become magnetized by a lightning strike. Hans Christian Ersted was the first to conduct experiments to examine the effect of electricity on a magnetized needle. He was able to demonstrate that a magnetized needle would be deflected by a wire running parallel to the needle. This led to the discovery that magnetic fields could be produced by electric currents as well as magnets. 
Andre Marie Ampere, exactly a week after Ersted's discovery, was able to show that two parallel wires carrying current would attract each other if the currents were in the same direction. Ampere continued to study the phenomena and in 1825 published his collection of results in one of the most celebrated memoirs. Ampere firmly believed in the concept of equal and oppositely directed forces between pairs of particles and he rejected the idea of seeking a more speculative explanation in terms of fluids and ethers. Nevertheless, he indicated two concepts which are related to an ether concept. In the first, he suggested that the ponderomotive force between circuits carrying electric current may be due to the reaction of the elastic fluid which extends through all space, whose vibrations produce the phenomenon of light and which is put in motion by electric currents. This fluid or ether, he said, could be no more than that which results from the combination of the two electricities. In the second concept, he suggested that the interspaces between metallic molecules of a wire which carry a current may be occupied by a fluid composed of two electricities, not in the proportions which form the neutral fluid, but with an excess of one type and which consequently masks the other. Ampere developed the theory of the equivalence of magnets with circuits carrying currents. He showed that an electric current is equivalent in its magnetic effects to a distribution of magnetism on a surface terminated by the circuit. He preferred to consider the current rather than the magnetic fluid as the fundamental entity. To him, magnetism was really an electric phenomena. Each magnetic molecule owes its properties, according to his view, to the presence within it of a small closed circuit in which an electric current is perpetually flowing. So impressive was Ampere's work that it would leave a lasting mark. Almost 50 years later, Maxwell would refer to it as one of the most brilliant achievements in science. Not long after the discovery of Ersted, a connection was discovered between galvanism and heat. In 1822, Thomas John Seebeck demonstrated that an electric current can be set up in a circuit of metals merely by having a temperature gradient. To this new class of circuits, the name thermoelectric was given. Cavendish had investigated the power of metals to conduct electrostatic discharges. Davy took this further by examining the conducting voltaic currents. He discovered that the conducting power of a wire formed of any metal is inversely proportional to its length and directly proportional to its cross-sectional area, but independent of the shape of the cross-section. This showed that the voltaic currents flowed through the substance of the conductor and not along the surface. He also studied the effects of temperature and found that the conductivity varied with temperature, being lower at higher temperatures. He also observed that the same magnetic power is exhibited by every part of the same circuit, even though it is formed of wires of different conducting powers pieced into a chain. The current which flows in a voltaic circuit therefore depends not only on the conductors which form the circuit, but also the driving power of the battery. In order to form a complete theory of voltaic circuits, it was therefore necessary to extend Davy's law by taking this into account. This advancement would come in 1826 by Georg Simon Ohm. Ohm had already carried out a considerable amount of experimental work on the subject. His focus was on combining all the known results into a consistent theory. For this purpose, he adopted the idea of comparing the flow of electricity in a current to the flow of heat along a wire. This would allow the electricity to be passed on from one particle to the next only if they were situated close enough to each other. This comparison led directly to the adoption of the driving power acting on the electricity. In order to achieve this, he had to rely on Volta's theory of the electrostatic conditions of the open pile. Ohm's memoirs marked a great advance in the electrical philosophy. It was now clearly understood that the current flowing in a conductor depended not only on the conductivity inherent in the conductor, and on another variable which bears to the electricity the same relation to that temperature bears to heat. This was the key to connecting the theory of current with the older theories of electrostatics. In the next part, we will return to look at the developments of the ether concept. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.